thank you so much for our wonderful music team. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Good morning and welcome to the Transforming and Transformative Unity Church of San Antonio. I'm Maggie Meggs and I'll be your celebration host this morning. I recently heard a spiritual teacher say that our four major tasks are to clean up, grow up, wake up, and show up. And this is a wonderful spiritual community in which to do all of those. And I know for me it's a continual process because I seem to fall back asleep many times after I wake up. So welcome to all of those, uh, all of you who have shown up today. Let's start by reciting our new vision together. As divine love, we envision a spiritually transformed, peaceful world. And how do we do this? It's we dance in the truth of who we are through meditation, study, and service. And now Tim Torres, our board uh, on the board of trustees, will introduce our very special speaker today. Yeah, no, there I can't. It is. You, don't, there it is. you don't want me to talk louder. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, all right. So our guest uh, minister this morning, our guest speaker is Reverend Jimmy Scott. Reverend Jimmy Scott has been a unity minister for 33 years. He loves practicing the principles and truly believes every moment in life is an opportunity to learn about oneself and that it can be fun. He considers himself a pragmatic optimist who believes everything can get better and it does because the universe is a spiritual entity and life is a spiritual practice that requires growth and expansion. Jimmy is here with his wife, Mary. Would you please give them a warm welcome? Thank you. Thank you. And we're really looking forward to hearing your talk today, Reverend Jimmy. So let's give a warm welcome to our invisible online listeners. Hey. And also, would the children and teens who are present in the room stand up, please? All right. Great. And we have a blessing for these children and teens and any other teens that you hold in your heart. Let's together, let's bless them. Children, children and, and teens, we know, we know who you, you are. are. You, you are, are the light of God. God. We love you, we bless you, we celebrate you, and we see you doing great things. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For the benefit of those of you who have not been here before, um, we have been in the search for a new minister, and uh, Reverend Jimmy is our ministerial candidate. And so what we've done for each of the visitors is we have, have them give a talk in the service, and then there's a reception afterwards over in the community center, and then they to do a workshop for us at 1.15. So that's what's going to happen today. You all should have a survey. We want your input. We want your input on how you experience this candidate because we want a good match, a good fit between the minister and the congregation. So remember that by our bylaws, the Board of Trustees actually do the, the hiring, but they are very invested in hearing from you. So please thoughtfully fill out your surveys. For those of you who've been coming here for a little while and have some questions and would maybe like to have a, just a little bit smaller venue to talk to and ask about the church, we have a reception September 17th at 1230, right after the service. We'd ask you to sign up if you could, just because we'd get a little bit of food for that, and, but, but you're, you're certainly welcome uh, on that day if you can make it. And last but not least, in terms of official announcements, is the Pinwells for P Pinwheels for Peace. Going to be, uh, Jennifer does a great, great job with our youth ministry. And this, I, I looked at the website for this, and I would invite you to do it. Uh, this is a project 
that goes on internationally. The United Nations has been involved in this. The actual day is, the, right? It's the 21st. I actually, But the kids are going to do it on the 24th after the service. You can actually download your own template to make one of those really cool little pinwheels. They invite people to write messages of peace and bring them to public places and, and post them. And it took me a while to get this, but you know, world peace, world peace. Got it? Okay. So actually, I have to do one of those. All right. So we've come to our community prayer uh, portion right now of the service. And if you'd like to write out a prayer intention now, there are cards in the seat back pocket in front of you. I invite you to do that. So, as I mentioned, the central theme for World Day of Prayer is peace in the midst. And at times, it's really hard to remember that there is so much more than the visible world around us. And for me, study, prayer, and meditation are what keep me anchored in spiritual truth, my source of peace. For today's community prayer, I was inspired by this quote from Cynthia Bourgeau, an Episcopalian priest and mystic. She says, visible reality lives and breathes in a rhythmic exchange with the invisible or unmanifest. And only as we breathe in that full rhythmic exchange can we possibly come to understand our true human purpose and belonging. As the hurricane winds and rain devastate the land and lives of so many, we must be able to breathe in compassion for all those affected while staying aware of the unity principle that divine source is goodness and everywhere present. The how and why of this remain a mystery to me, so sometimes I find it's best just to sit still, breathe, and open to this great mystery of deep divine love that is always present as unmanifest goodness. And while most of us are lucky enough not to be physically affected by many of the natural and human disasters going on right now, most likely we have our own inner hurricanes, our own devastations of grief and loss and painful relationship. So I invite you now to bring that which you need to sit with into our community prayer and allow the great mystery of divine presence to open you and the world to its healing. So please settle yourself into a posture that will allow you to feel relaxed and present, feet firmly grounded to Mother Earth, the concrete manifestation of unmanifest divine love. Become aware of your beautiful, temporary body as you sit quietly, breathing slowly in and out. Becoming fully aware of this breath, our literal connection with divine life. Breathing in sorrows of the world, breathing out divine goodness, anchoring ourselves in that rhythm of manifest and unmanifest, visible and invisible, knowing all the while this great truth of godness, of goodness, present right now in the midst of our storms, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of uncertainty, visible chaos, invisible divine love and order. Breathe in, breathe out, no matter the material circumstance. We are centered in truth, hearts opened in great compassion, 
great love and even great sorrow as we feel the sufferings of the visible realm. But always, always held in the greater mystery of a divine love without beginnings, without endings, unlimited and unlimiting. Find your peace in the presence and return to your visible world with a new spirit of love and resilience and compassion. Raise your hand as spiritual consciousness. Calm the waters of your fretful mind and walk into your full divine potential. Breathe in divine love. Breathe out divine goodness. And so it is. Amen. You've heard my name, but I like saying it, so I'm going to say it again. My name is Jimmy Scott, and I'm delighted to be here this morning. I want to start off this morning by taking just a few moments uh, to thank you for inviting me here to your uh, beautiful church, to thank the Board of Trustees for inviting me to be a part of this uh, process. And a hearty thank you to Flavio, who uh, took his Saturday yesterday to take Mary and me around the city and to meet all the friendly people and to see some of the sights, uh, do the river walk and a number of other things. Uh, this is a fantastic city. I want to thank Linda for her tenure of ministry here. Uh, she's done an incredible job here. I, I can see that. And I want to thank you all for being a part of, of unity. Uh, unity is really important to me. It's literally saved my life. I would not be here if it wasn't for unity. It didn't do anything other than teach me to discover who I am. Uh, so on some, in some sense of the word, that's a small thing. But in another sense of the word, it's, it's pretty huge uh, because I found myself. Uh, Brief history, I almost died twice before I was 18 from alcohol poisoning. I started when I was about 13 years of age. I grew up in a small rural community, not much to do, so managed to find ways to get myself in trouble. And uh, along came Unity many years later to help me begin to understand myself and to realize why I made some of the choices that I made. I chose uh, this morning's message about uh, awakening for an important reason for me and I think an important reason for everyone in the world. Um, once we change our worldview and begin to understand how magnificent and how complicated the universe is, um, we, we start on a journey that uh, we're sometimes aware that we're on it and then there are other times we're not so much aware. Things are taking place in our lives and we're making shifts and changes and decisions and sometimes we do that kind of unconsciously. And um, then something special comes along. We make a decision maybe to go to the university or to join the military or to uh, get married or whatever, make these major decisions. And there are moments when we awaken and we realize, oh, I love this person. I, I think I want to be with this person for the rest of my life. Or, I, I love this career opportunity, so I'm going to take advantage of it. So these things happen to us just as a normal part of the living process. But many times they're happening and we don't take full advantage of them because we kind of sleepwalk through them in my estimation. So that's where I came up with this idea about awakening. 
I'm very familiar with it because my life has been a lifelong process of awakening. Uh, awakening to my spirit, awakening to my soul. There's a quote by the Irish writer John O'Donohue. He said, and I quote, once the soul awakens, the search begins and you can never go back. From then on, you are inflamed with a special longing that will never again let you linger in the lowlands of complacency and partial fulfillment because the eternal in you, the soul in you, makes you urgent. You are loath to let compromise or the threat of danger hold you back from striving forward to the summit of fulfillment. And that's what life is about. It's about finding fulfillment. So anyone here ever linger in the lowlands of complacency? <laughs> in your job? In your family? In your relationships? Your recovery program? Your behavior patterns? Your business? Your spiritual growth? Anyone here ever linger in the lowlands? <laughs> you can tell yourself any story you choose. I've been all around long enough to know that we all do it. And what I also know is that complacency will drag you down. It will eat away at your motivation. Complacency will slowly drive a person to depression, even make a person wonder why they are alive. I've been through all of this. And the joy of life I've found comes from our encounters with new experiences. And that's what we should be seeking every moment of our lives. And that's what we should be open and receptive to. Somebody said, we Americans will put up with anything as long as it doesn't block traffic. Doesn't block traffic. <laughs> so the great thing about living in these great United States is there's always something going on. And there's always some challenges taking place. And we know from Hurricane Harvard and we know from this current hurricane that it's going to be a long road ahead of us as a nation. Uh, you may or may not have families involved in this tragedy, but uh, my, our daughter lived in Houston for 16 or 17 years. Fortunately, they moved away a few years ago, but they still have friends there who live in neighborhoods that are inundated. And I knew some of them, of course, in our visits with our daughter. We were able to make their acquaintance. And so I feel for them, and I understand how difficult this journey of recovery is going to be, not just for us, but for them and for the whole nation, because it's going to be a long road ahead. We're talking billions of dollars to be able to restore just a, some semblance of normalcy, but nowhere near the places that they once were. So it's a long journey ahead. And it requires all of us to deepen our faith and to understand that there is a power greater than us that enables us to overcome pretty much anything. There's a point in the scriptures where the Apostle Paul writes a letter to the church in Rome. And it's found uh, in chapter 3. But it actually goes all the way through chapter 16. And I'm not going to read <laughs> So I don't want anyone getting nervous. <laughs> oh, God. Uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing to you. But there are some points of emphasis that I want to share with you because I think they are, they are important. The first thing he talks about is a world under grace. 
that had, in his estimation, only two choices, as Paul saw it. And those two, two choices were ruination or recovery. He talked about ruination from the standpoint of their loss of faith, their lack of cohesion, willingness to stick together. He talked to them because of their willingness to conform to what he considered to be the status quo instead of looking out and broadening their horizon and seeing if they couldn't move into greater things. And he also talked to them first and probably foremost from his perspective about their lack of respect for spiritual teachings, to put it in modern day terms. So now after this long drawn out process, which he goes through 16 chapters of scripture, and if you've read the Bible, you know, that's a lot of talking. And he's telling them what was wrong, but then he arrives at a point in uh, chapter 13, and it's verse 11, and he says, here's the solution. Light always overcomes darkness. That simple, but that profound. Light always overcomes darkness. And then he sort of puts the nail in the coffin, so to speak, and he turns to them and he said, now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than we believed. Now, if you spent any time in the Baptist church, which is where I spent some of my youth, the term salvation is not one of those words you, you like hearing about. <laughs> because generally, when the preacher started talking about salvation, he was talking about don't do this, don't do that, got to save your soul and go to heaven, all of those things. Truth is, the word salvation was never that complicated. It's really about having an informed faith. That's what it's really about. It's also about understanding who and what we are. And then it's about believing at a deeper level. And so Paul was telling the Romans that their challenge was right in front of them. It's right in the perpetual now, not in some great faraway place off somewhere, but right before them. He was telling them that now is the time to awake and to do what is yours to do. They had a defense and they naturally wanted to argue. And I've always wondered about why we need to argue when we hear the truth, because I've been one of those people who argued when my grandmother would tell me the truth about myself, I'd have some argue or some defense for it. And he also told them that your defense is within you, but so also is your need for well-being. And he said, you have a responsibility to call forth what you desire. They had the responsibility to infuse themselves with love and with action and to do something and stop sitting around waiting for something to happen, make it happen instead. So at some point, his message takes hold of them and they wake up. And they start to do great things. And if you've read anything about the history of Rome, you know that it was one of the greatest uh, civilizations on this planet. So they slowly began to understand the teachings and stop waiting on grace to fall down from heaven for them and started to make things happen. Walt Whitman probably summed this whole thing up for me better than anybody. Whitman said, let your soul stand cool and composed before a million universes. Let your soul stand cool and composed 
before a million universes. Awakenings are not just for the spiritual giants that we admire and read about. Spiritual awakenings are not the sole property of the mystics. They are for you and for me. And if we're not awake when we're moving through this journey of life, we miss out on a lot. I've been fortunate enough to live a long life, to have enjoyed a lot of success, and I hope to continue to do that same thing. But no matter what I'm doing, I want to be able to do it with gusto and to feel it and to know that I'm making a difference. So no matter where you are today in your thought process or in your career or in your life or in your family, I want you to know that there's always some light at the end of the tunnel. That we never have to expect or assume or demand. It just comes by virtue of who we are and what we believe. So if we do the best that we can to control the circumstances that we're under and we learn to accept that we can't always control everything, then once we've done that, everything else seems to fall in place. Life can be simple when we focus on one thing at a time. You don't have to do it all. Nobody has to do it all. There's always help. That's true for each one of us in this sanctuary this morning. That's true for the people who've been impacted deeply by this catastrophic event. One other piece of information that I think is real important is everybody goes through changes. And sometimes we never know why we're going through them other than we think it's just natural and a part of life. But sometimes it's important for us to take charge of the change that we're going through. And so we don't make changes for other people. We have to make them for ourselves. And when we make them for ourselves, we impact other people in ways that are quite profound and deep. So I want to tell you just a little personal story about me. As I said, uh, I had a pretty chaotic uh, experience in life. A lot of ups and downs. And uh, ministry was, I think, my salvation. It uh, enabled me to look at myself for who I am for the first time in my life. I was 38 when I began this journey. Uh, it was probably the most difficult thing I've ever done in my life. Uh, we had created a family in Kentucky that uh, we were enjoying, and uh, all of a sudden I create a world of upheaval by going in and telling my wife that, you know what, you're going to leave all of this, and I'm going to Detroit to study for the ministry. And she said, are you crazy? <laughs> and I said, no, I'm serious. And I went to Detroit Unity's Urban Ministerial School, spent uh, two years there um, doing ministry in what you might call an internship, and then finished that. And, went out to Unity School, and uh, I got there, and I was integrated into a class of 34 other people, and uh, we were all very much bonded together um, for our last year of ministerial training. The interesting thing about my class was that it had a number of uh, rebels in it. <laughs> And so we were always stretching the boundaries of what was allowed to be done. And rebellion is a part of my nature. I'm a rebel without a pause, so that was, <laughs> was right at home. And um, 
Long story short, we moved through the process and we get to graduation day and they call me and some of my fellow classmates into the office and said, uh, you guys will not be ordained. Uh, it was a shock to all of us. A couple of my classmates were pretty well situated politically, so uh, they were able to change circumstances and conditions fairly quickly. So I left the seminary that afternoon and I uh, was devastated. I put a lot of work into to it and I kind of torn down my family to make that journey and I felt for them and I felt for myself and I had a habit of when things got chaotic I drive out to Lake Giacomo, which is just a short few miles from Unity Village, and I'd stand there, or sit there, and just watch the water. So that's what I did. I drove out there, and I sat down at a picnic table, and I was just watching the water, and thinking, trying to get my head clear, how was I going to go back to the ceremony that night and be introduced as not being ordained, and all of the mental stuff that goes on in your head when you start feeling all of a sudden less than. So I'm sitting at this table and I hear a car drive up. And uh, then I hear the door close and I hear the sound of gravel crunching. And the immediate thought I had was, who is this is intruding on my misery? So I'm sitting there and I refuse to turn around and acknowledge the person. Came up and he sat down on the seat behind me. He must have sat there for five, six minutes. And then he began to talk. And he started telling me about his wife, 50 years who had just passed, how lonely he was how much he loved his children. And I turn around, and I start listening. And I thought, God, this is ministry. This is why I'm here. So that night, I went back, and I got in line. And when I walked across the stage, and they said, Jimmy Scott, licensed university minister, this is after about 20 ordinations. The whole room stood up and started to applaud. I'm the only guy who's ever been applauded for falling short of the goal. <laughs> but I learned so much about myself and about people and about compassion and about understanding and about the willingness to be and to be in the world, to give the world the best. I learned about connection. This gentleman didn't know me from Adam, but he poured out his soul right there because he needed somebody to pour out his soul to. And we think we're here to do all the great things that we do, and that's wonderful. They are great things. I mean, we accomplish more probably than any nation in the world, and we'll always do that, I believe. But that underlying spirit that enables us to just be connected and to allow the spirit of the universe to lead us and to guide us, that's the greatest asset we have. So you folks got an incredible ministry here. Support it, love it, and appreciate it, expand it, and have fun doing it. Because if it ain't fun, it ain't worth doing. God bless you.
few moments for a time of meditation and prayer, if you don't mind. So I don't know what your meditational practice is, but I always believe in just getting comfortable. Close your eyes, shut out the external world. Maybe the most important thing is to begin to slow your mind down. Just set aside all the busyness of your life, all the busyness of your day. And give yourself permission to become quiet and still. In the Old Testament, the prophet Jeremiah reminded us that God does not speak to us in those large and great moments. God speaks to us in the silence. And so that means stillness is a prerequisite. After becoming still, we have to be willing to listen. So the first thing I want to do is invite you to make sure you're comfortable. Let go of any tightness or any tension in your body. Just completely relax. And take note of your breath. Let's breathe in deeply. And relax and release it. silence for a few moments, even if it becomes uncomfortable, just remind yourself to be still. We give thanks today for the whole Spirit of God that moves and has its being in each one of us. We give thanks for the blessings of our world for the strength and the courage and the faith and the wisdom and the will to keep on keeping on. We give thanks for the indomitable spirit of Christ that lives in our souls and gently reminds us from time to time who we are and what we are capable of. We send our blessings forth to all humanity throughout the world. Our continued prayer for connection and for the realization of our oneness. Claim all of this in the name and through the nature of the living Christ. And so it is. Amen.
This message has been brought to you by Unity Church of San Antonio to open your heart, transform your life, and celebrate your divine identity. Visit us on the web at www.unityofsa.org. And remember, you are the light of God. So shine brightly today.